Well, I can't uh, tell you what a thrill it is for me to read uh, with a group such as this. Uh, John Stone's poetry I've admired for many years, not had a chance to meet him until this evening. And I owe uh, Mark Strauss for having uh, recovered me as a writer, uh, having saved my life in that way by introducing me to Tom Lux uh, many years ago. So. Uh, it's a very meaningful evening for me. Uh, people, when they first hear about physicians writing, always wonder, you know, uh, why this should happen, how is this possible? Uh, I love this quote from Anton Chekhov, who was a terrific physician in a tuberculosis hospital for many years. Medicine is my lawful wife, and literature is my mistress. When I get fed up with one, I spend the night with the other. Though it is irregular, it is less boring this way, and besides, neither of them loses anything through my infidelity. Uh, there is a long history of physician uh, writers, uh, Francois Rabelais and uh, Tobias Smollett, Schiller, John Keats, who never actually practiced, uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes, who did, of course, and the person who got me into writing as a little boy, uh, was Arthur Conan Doyle uh, and Malk Morley's wonderful introduction to the complete Sherlock Holmes where he said a blessing then upon those patients who never got to the ophthalmology practice of Doyle which was very unsuccessful. While he was sitting there bored he started writing these beloved stories, Chekhov and of course William Carlos Williams. So I'm going to begin with a couple of poems that try to explain the relationship between medicine and poetry. Uh, I go every summer to Tom's uh, Writer's Seminar Program at Sarah Lawrence. This summer will be my ninth year. And a graduate student, I don't know whether this was apocryphal, liter literal, true, uh, that our greatest uh, physician poet, William Carlos Williams, delivered one of America's other great poets into the world. And this poem is called, Dr. Williams Delivers a Baby. <clears throat> Dr. Williams was making his rounds, one dilapidated house than another, powdered oxygen on the aluminum siding, brown shingles on the roofs. In between visits, he'd sit in his car, a notebook on his lap and arrange words, instruments on a surgical tray, Uterine sounds, blunt as tire irons, scalpels sharper than paper. Often a cry from within the house would bring him running past its yard, past a tomato plant or wheelbarrow or red hen, things he took in as he sprang up the porch steps, hoping the family was already in the parlor, had put the kettle on, and had found clean towels and disinfectant to swab the wound, or welcome the crowning head. He put down his old-fashioned doctor's bag, a satchel peaked like a dormer at both ends, his initials stamped in gold, long ago faded, and took off his wool overcoat. Tonight, he noted the burdened bookshelves, responsible chair, the goosenecked reading lamp, the desk loaded with papers, writing tools, and a folding pince-nez. The father was a professor or writer of some degree who could afford both coal and electric. He suspected they were Jewish, the mother of German ancestry, the father Sephardic, but had no reason to know. In truth, he had only a cursory familiarity with their tribe and knew no Hebrew. But the mother's cry, soon, it was going to be soon. He timed her pain until a dark spot between her labia grew, and it was time to prep and drape her. Then he encouraged the head with a gloved hand, turned the shoulders, and delivered the rest. Dr. Williams told the father it looked like a writer, this noisy boy, vigorous and exploring. They would name him Alan. This next uh, poem uh, I read on uh, NPR this past year. They had a series on the first year of medical school. And I, by chance, had written a poem uh, several years ago about my first day in medical school, which will bring 
I think the concept of patience and how we read the world together. Uh, the poem is called The Ice House. Later, in our yearbook, they caption a photo of George, his mouth gaping open as if to say, we're going to carry what up from where? That first day of class, two or three of us at a time lift bodies onto a fireman's stretcher and carry the corpses out of a late 19th century red brick Victorian across a small courtyard and up a short flight of stairs into the anatomy lab next door. The dead weigh more than we do. Fresh from the ice house, they're heavier still, hands at their sides, standing attention in repose, their clay-colored faces flat as cardboard, eyes closed, lips pursed, holding in the separate secrets of their final moments, the fleeing of their souls. Because of a shortage in donations, it's four to a body. Over the next weeks and months, nerves and tendons come up to greet the ministrations of our knives. We give them names before we flay in order, their extremities, belly, heart, and head, and leave nothing much behind except attachments to bone, the black tongue, and the brain in its casement. Not all of us are equally deft. You can already tell who the future surgeons are and who the psychoanalysts. We make the usual jokes about girls who study late and fall asleep over the bodies, but in general, these dead get a modicum of respect not accorded them in life. They're the first people we learn to read like books, exemplars of the future, and texts off the street. Uh, Tom mentioned that uh, <clears throat> later uh, this year I've got a, a big collection coming out uh, called The Clock Made of Confetti. And this is the title poem. Uh, and Keats's concept of negative capability, very important to poets ever since, I think is an extreme form of empathy, which is, of course, what the doctor must evince at the bedside, to have empathy with his patient, not just sympathy, but some feeling for what he's going through. This poem is kind of an obad. It's a farewell. If you've lost anybody, a lover, uh, a relative, uh, the clock made of confetti. It takes a long time. All those blossoms had to bloom and die first. The stars shaped for Scythia swept under by red and white azalea petals scattered like confetti the morning after a big party when no one remembers what they're celebrating. Then the pink crab apple had to let go its love notes, lately interred with a white Bradford pear. There were more who fell than I can remember embraced by age and the slow pull of gravitation. Cicada shells I kicked out of my way, and the brown wren, too small for this winter, brought down by some marauding cat. I repeated your name each day until snow covered the lawn with its white leopard's breath, and when it melted, and spring came, I knew you were gone. Once I left full-time academia, I, I was the chairman of neurosurgery at the University of Maryland. I started to pay a little bit more attention to my environment other than the hospital. And recently, I've started to write some poems about the city of Baltimore. <clears throat> and this uh, poem is called, Baltimore Was Always Blue. Goodbye, America of the blue overalls and steel-toed boots. Goodbye, goodbye. The headline in the sun said it all today in type as tall as the re-election of a president. General Motors closes its Browning Highway plant. Don't you remember when they said what was good for GM was good for America? 
In the 40s, they called men like Bob at the gym expediters. They sorted parts for 50 cents an hour, everything in its proper place at the right time. Goodbye to you and the smell of cayenne and cinnamon drifting over the inner harbor when it had rotting piers and McCormick spice. Goodbye, goodbye, General Mills, Bendix, and Western Electric. Farewell to the steel plate and memories of Liberty ships, their hulls bent true and shaped at Sparrow's Point by 30,000 hands. Goodbye to London Fog, its raincoats and umbrellas, born in Baltimore, raised everywhere, and sterling silver candlesticks turned on lathes in Hamden. Goodbye, steel beams, locomotives and trains, automobiles and ships, military bombers, telephones, stoves, and natty bow beer. Over half a century, a city dies a thousand cuts. Condos rise where breweries stood. The Ritz-Carlton goes up at Beth Steele, and office towers are put where Procter and Gamble made soap on the harbor. Near Seagirt Marine, 7,000 men and women, too, made metal vans, things on wheels we import from Japan. For 70 years, while New York and Chicago wore tweed, top coats and gray fedoras, Baltimore was dressed in blue. Now it's goodbye to factory whistles, tin hats, lunch pails filled with ham and mayonnaise. No welders eat Italian on Holabird Avenue. No salesmen sleep at the Brentwood and Carson Inns. No one raises a shot to a crab at the Ponca Bird Pub. It's goodbye to all that. And some of you may know the World War I uh, memoir by the poet Robert Graves, which is called Goodbye to All That. <clears throat> I had the great pleasure this past year to appear in an award-winning documentary on the brain and creativity called Euphoria and to read one of my poems uh, in the movie. And uh, when I finally got to see it uh, in uh, Maryland, uh, I was so taken by what the artist Lee Boot had done with this film that I wrote a poem called Euphoria uh, that has a calculation about the brain built into it and also has something about my love of sailing on the Chesapeake Bay. Euphoria. <clears throat> the world is round from 40 miles away only the top masts of ships appear headed to the bay bridge, their hulls buried beneath the curvature of gray water along a short segment of latitude. If you find the angle at which something shrinks to nothing, you can get the distance, a cross of wood, a length of twine, and soon enough, the equator of existence becomes a number as real as the belly of an apple, a thing in the mind. At sea, you never doubt their rapture. Archimedes predicting Newton, Mickelson his Einstein, their excitement transparent without fog of drug or spectacle. And how big would a forest have to be if each tree stood for a single neuron in such a brain, a field as large as Manhattan, or Rhode Island, or all of Montana, we calculate such vastness. We do not measure. Here is the child's answer, stretching his arms beyond his parents' grasp. This big, his body says. No, really, how big? This big, no, bigger. And perhaps the greatest American poet of the 20th century, Wallace Stevens, uh, was very interested in things of the mind, in the mind. Uh, and that poem is really a gloss on, on his metaphysical interests. I was uh, working and listening to classical music, not in the operating room, but at home. And I heard a piece by a second-level 19th century composer who I had only known about because of the peculiar nature of his death. 
And when I heard the name of the poem, uh, the name of the piece of music, I said to myself, God, that's a poem. And so this poem is called Notes on First Hearing Alcan's Funeral March. It seemed a peculiar thing to do, compose a funeral march on the death of a parrot. Alcan, a piano prodigy, an intermittent hermit, was known to be crabby, sensitive, and overwrought. When Chopin died in 1849, Alcan withdrew from giving concerts and locked himself up in a two-story apartment, one large enough that he could play his pedalier, a grotesque chimera of organ pedal board and grand piano, without disturbing his neighbors. He was not seen in public again for 25 years. Perhaps the parrot was his sole companion, the only one who could stand the noise, not to imply the relationship was odd in other ways and his grief commensurate with his loss. Of course, the death of composers is better known than the deaths of their pets. Alcan's own is even more famous than all but a few, including Gershwin's brain tumor, misdiagnosed as a type of neurosis, and Lully's death from gangrene in his great toe three months after he'd stabbed himself with a sharply pointed walking stick while vigorously conducting an opera. In 1888, Charles Valentin Alcan killed himself when a complete set of the Talmud fell on his head. Death by knowledge was appropriately rewarded by burial in Montmartre on April Fool's Day, the obituary said it was necessary for him to die in order to suspect his existence. The next is a, a short poem, <clears throat> relatively recent, uh, that's already found a home, I'm happy to say, about my father. And, and when I say it's already found a home, almost any poem I write, a, write about my father, some editor will fall in love with. Uh, he's a great guy, he'll be 95 this June, still golfs every other day. And uh, I guess they can feel that empathy that I was talking about before when I write about him. <clears throat> it's called Cutting Apples. My father always carried a penknife to pare his green apples, raising their skins in perfect spirals. He never drew blood slicing his bananas for breakfast, their dark-seated cores like little faces, dropping into the milk, one more item in a life of a thousand chores, one more notch in a life advancing by millimeters or inches, not seconds or days. I watched him turn himself as carefully away from violence as a lathe on a table leg, cutting each curve and flourish from the flat face of a block clamped in his hand. His hand and its thumb never shied from the blade. He knew that what you do with any tool gives it its value, like a life, not too eager or afraid. Here's another uh, shorty. It's uh, the length of a sonnet. It's a contemporary 14-liner. <clears throat> and it's composed of seven pairs of rhyming couplets uh, about something terrible that we've had to do on the Chesapeake Bay. It's called A Lamentation of Swans. But besides being sad, it's the old English word for a group of swans, uh, just like a pod of whales or a pack of hounds, a lamentation. A lamentation of swans. Like immortal cells growing in a dish, the alien swans multiply beyond our wish for silent beauty. And the buried day rises as a dream. How to kill the mute swans, its theme. One Tchaikovsky never penned is now debated in shoreside bars and fens by oystermen who lift their glasses in sad farewell to black skimmers and underwater grasses. They mourn the native tundra swan and the least turn before it too is gone. 
And if alien beauty must be trapped or shot or poisoned, its nested eggs addled not to hatch, they're willing to concede how often beauty breeds dark necessity. What do I have, Tom? Ten minutes? Five minutes? Five? I'm going to uh, read you the description of a neurosurgical procedure backwards in reverse, uh, the closure. Uh, it's a poem called Perfect. Perfect. This is what we meant for it to be, backing out of the brain, letting eloquent lips close over, the small spitting heart of a bruised vessel recently clipped shut, or hiding the bed from which unruly cells had been wrestled, removing ourselves and our miniature extensions, closing the dura mater with a crochet of sutures, as if zippering a body bag over a person's head, replacing the lid of sawed bone, sprinkling its dust into holes pneumatically drilled four hours ago after lifting a dog ear of muscle and cutting a semicircle of scalp and skin with blade and hot smoking wire from just in front of an oracle to just above a brow, and now, now, no longer looking in, but looking out, at the soul propped up in bed, its crown of bandages turbaned and taped, its eyelids bruised and closed with seepage, its mostly successful struggle to awake in minutes, in hours, even the next day, applauded as perfect by our own exhausted eyes. And the final poem, a uh, very small that I'm going to read, <clears throat> is this problem that we who have more than one iron in the fire, I guess, constantly have. You know, we're doing one thing, we love operating be beneath the microscope or taking care of cancer patients or listening to the heart, and we love writing and art and all sorts of things. And this is a common condition of all humans. And uh, so after a poem called Perfect, here's a poem called Envy. This fine day, I'm eating paint, licking it from my fingers after spraying air vents on my lawn, their white bowl-shaped cowls resting on the backyard grass. Too far from the sloop, they ordinarily grace. An industrious bee investigates the pansies and boxed violets. The pollen and budding trees hang heavy on the sea of grass. My blood has slowed from dozing, endlessly wishing for something else. Not merely beauty, but the beautiful. What the sailor feels on land and the farmer on the ocean. Thank you.